I think one game changer that hasn't been addressed here that can directly help in this is hybrid work. And we saw in many environments during the COVID time that you saw this kind of split, that basically you had companies that did very well. They were all working remote. They reported morale going up, a lot of people finding that work-life balance like we talked about last week. And then other companies, they're wanting to go back to the traditional nine to five being in the office. I don't think you can go from one spectrum to the other, but I think that what's going to come out of this of the workplace of the future is going to be a hybrid. Okay, Brian, instead of making you commute five days a week, maybe we have you commute two to three days a week. So there's some sort of kind of middle ground. I know as you were mentioning mm-hmm. to me earlier that, you know, your father's been one of those who's typically, you know, commuted 90 miles each way, you know, for many, many years. And that was in terms of in a choice that people make when they try to balance their quality of life and desirability where they learn. But we have to kind of go and take into account in terms of those things that there is an inherent cost. And the cost isn't just financials in terms of our own psyche, our, our, you know, quality of life in terms of and all that and reflect on that. But that's how you directly answer our participation and role and why inflation is the way that it is. Good afternoon and welcome to Ascending Thoughts, the show where we discuss the issues of the day and the strategies of how to overcome and ascend to greater personal and business success. I'm Brian Raglan. I'm with our host, Mr. Rogers, himself, the voice of reason in these tumultuous times and renowned business advisor. I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Rogers to the show. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a beautiful day to podcast. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Brian, it's, it's a wonderful day out today. What's going on in your world? What's going on in your neighborhood? I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about inflation and what we can do as people and business owners and stuff like that to um, to to maintain and to help uh, get us to better better places. I see it's a lot, you know, in terms of an affecting our local communities as we go in terms of in these neighborhoods and as how we feel. You know, we're starting in summer. And for many of us, this is our first summer because we feel like we've been kind of, you know, locked away for the last three years for better part um, due to COVID. And there's this kind of this this angst, this, this desire that we really want to get out there. And then all of a sudden we feel that we've been, you know, hit blindsided by, you know, in terms of just soaring costs and prices out of control. Unfortunately, in terms of economically speaking, this has just been part of what's been sowing out there. The government had, you know, to kind of provide a lifeline to everyone when we initially started in the pandemic, injected billions of dollars and tri- literally five trillion into the economy. So there was a tremendous amount of money passing through the system. But some of the bigger aspects that we as people and consumers are going to have to try to digest and take into account so that we can be smarter and ascend through this this time is understanding that a lot of disruption happened to our normal supply chains. So when we talk about how our lives had gotten disrupted, that people's kids were going to school via Zoom, you weren't able to socialize, you weren't able to travel, lots of places were closed down. Well, many of the goods that we use in daily lives also got affected as well. If you remember during those times when there was limits on toilet paper and hand sanitizer, well, believe it or not, you're seeing in terms of effect buying new cars. You've been hearing, if you've been hearing about in terms of on the news, baby formula, that there's been shortages. Much of this is not necessarily directly from COVID. This has part of been in a long-term aspect that for greater part of 30 years that we have relied upon a lot of our goods coming from overseas and various different countries had been affected differently. And when you see particularly in Asia and as well as China, they're still experiencing lockdowns. They've been experiencing in terms of these massive surges and COVID in different waves, and they have tried to react to it differently. But the ripple effect that it shows is how 
We all share in terms of in the same globe that what happens in one part of the world directly impacts us here. And many of the goods that we rely upon that not only that there are delays, but as a result, that demand is completely outpacing what's coming in store shelves. So the end result has been this trickling down of massive inflation wherever we see and through the economy. And you're also seeing it when you go out to eat go to a restaurant if you're trying to go and basically buy some new clothes or some electronics as well as in terms of any good out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All great points. Um, I wanted to, uh, to see and to ask, is this going to be sort of the the new normal? I know we're coming out of COVID it's 2022. Um, Everybody's sort of coming out for, for summer and stuff. And I think the word on the street is, is everybody's tense about spending with, you said costs of good are going up for inflation and stuff. And that, from a macro standpoint, the whole world is in effect and the whole world, we're all together. Right. And I, uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, what, what can, um, what can we do as sort of individuals, even though we're all tied together, you know, are we going to have to, uh, to cut costs somewhere? So in terms of in this show is we can't go and speak for policymakers because in terms of the traditional ways, when we look at throughout history, policymakers, basically the principal way they're going to deal with inflation is going to be by raising fundamental interest rates. And that's not from elected individuals in terms of Congress or a president. That's just basically from our central reserve bank and as well as other central banks. And what their tactic that they're trying to do is basically make it more expensive to borrow money. So those people who go and get a new car, that car payment is going to be more. The credit cards, the debt that you're carrying on your credit cards, the the cost and the interest is going to go up. So the belief is by making it more expensive to borrow money, consumers will eventually pull back. But Mm -hmm. also the direct tie is basically businesses, because what we don't realize is that businesses in terms of hiring, expanding plants and making investments, they tend to go out and borrow money. And if it's more expensive, they're going to pull back on that. So that's the belief in terms of indirectly, it slows down the economy. Mm -hmm. The other interpretation, In terms of typical policy response, people say, well, we're coming up on election. Can't we just raise, can't we just lower taxes? Can't we just eliminate regulations? Those aren't anti-inflationary measures. Those are just meant or as a belief that they're going to go and stimulate the economy more. But our economy is overstimulated. Inflation is just a direct sign of that. So as we're getting here in terms of as the consumer and business perspective as we all operate is fundamentally most people are going to basically change and reassess how they spend their their money and their resources do we want to go out to the movies are you going to go out in terms of go out on friday nights are you going to go in terms of take the trip that you're planned maybe instead of hawaii you're going to go do a drive Many people are now using the term staycation. So people start to reassess of what's an absolute core priority versus, you know, supporting myself and then what I would like to do. That's the eventual trickle down effect. And the analogy I like to use is it's a hangover. It feels horrible and you end up working through it, but it eventually passes on. The issue is, is how long that it's going to be. But these are the stages that we're essentially going through as the economy and as consumers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, with with that pulling back, I think that we naturally want to consume and consume and consume and we want everything now. And I think that. And that's the worst possible mistake, because mm-hmm. we have to also take into account as people, as consumers, what we did to contribute to this. Because we have to look at when we define what is inflation, the first sign that we see is the cost to fill up our gas tank. That's the most direct cost. And if it was previously a year or two ago at $30 a week and then it's $50 a week and $75 a week, you're seeing in terms of your paycheck eroding. But we also have to go and get realistic what we as in terms of people at We're not guaranteed in terms of to go and have $2 gallon gas. 
that is just naive. It's delusional. And also, too, where many of those supplies come from. They tend to come from overseas. They tend to come from hostile governments, as we're seeing in terms of what's emerging in Ukraine with the war in terms of Ru the Russian invasion that has had a direct in terms of result. We also, as people, have to go and determine our reliance upon if our vehicles that we use that are not fuel efficient, those are choices that we made. We have to also understand the flip side costs that comes to it. And some of our responses that what we try to teach people to send do is what can we do that's counteractive and counteractive? Can we rethink holistically in terms of transportation? And many people, believe it or not, you're seeing rashes of people who don't own cars that they're trying to either use, you know, um, some sort of rideshare service like an Uber or Lyft. More and more people are living closer to work so that they can basically, you know, ride a bike or other alternate forms. But these are the things is when we look at these, we don't want to throw our hands up as though we have no other choice and all we can do is cut, cut, cut. We also have to think outside a box and how we can respond and change things instead of forcing ourselves as though we have no choice in this. Yeah, exactly that. And I think uh, for <clears throat> going off on those, uh, those subjects, the one for, for transportation, we're here in San Diego County and we're not in New York. We're not in Chicago or any other large metropolitan area. And so for, for me, it is relevant, but to what point do I, as a consumer, do I make that decision of, Hey, Maybe I uh, I might trade in um, my pickup truck for a, a more fuel efficient sedan or something like that. I think it it depends on each person and their. We went through a similar spotting. circumstance. Um, you were a bit young in terms of time in two thousand eight and two thousand nine. We had gas that was peaking over four dollars a gallon. It was on the cusp of five dollars a gallon. And I don't know if you recall, but the big three automakers in the U.S. were on, on the verge of bankruptcy and went to the government asking for a bailout. One of the compromises that they made that came out of that, that, you know, basically Ford, GM, and Chrysler did is, we need to make more fuel-efficient cars to answer this so that consumers have some choices out there. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, traditionally, as people were open and receptive to getting fuel-efficient cars, but let's face it, they were tiny little tin cans. They were ugly. Americans don't just like a car for the reason of point A to point B. It's very much in terms of the lifestyle piece. But there was a lack of choice back then. Secondly, Tesla did not have yet the Model S, the Model 3, the Model Y, completely different world that we were back then. We did not have the abundance of plug-in hybrid vehicles. When you look in terms of the number of Toyota vehicles, the number of Hondas, Fords, across clear car makers versus 2022. So clearly the choices are there. And if you fast forward three years from now, there's going to be even more choices. Secondly, in 2008, during in the time, we didn't have in terms of the network built out. You didn't have the Tesla network built out like they did with the supercharging stations. Mm -hmm. You go around to many of the malls that you see nowadays. You go to in and out around town and you see those little charging stations. You didn't see that in 2008 and 2009. Mm -hmm. It was in a very nascent. So we're along in terms of those costs. I'm just saying is that we as consumers have to understand understand and take account what we participate in that and understand. And we understand that we're in San Diego and that we don't have, you know, it took 20 years to build out that trolley line from Old Town up to UCSD. We don't have in terms of viable mass transit, but we do, we can critically go and honestly look at what can we do to at least improve our overall fuel economy. And the choices are there out there or as well as live closer to our workplaces. And thirdly, I think one game changer that hasn't been addressed here that can directly help in this is hybrid work. And we saw in many environments during the COVID time that you saw this kind of split, that basically you had companies that did very well. They were all working remote. They reported morale going up, a lot of people finding that work-life balance like we talked about last week. And then other companies, they're wanting to go back to the traditional nine to five being in the office. 
I don't think you can go from one spectrum to the other, but I think that what's going to come out of this of the workplace of the future is going to be a hybrid. Okay, Brian, instead of making you commute five days a week, maybe we have you commute two to three days a week. So there's some sort of kind of middle ground. I know as you were mentioning Mm -hmm. to me earlier that, you know, your father's been one of those who's typically, you know, commuted 90 miles each way, you know, for many, many years. And that was in terms of a choice that people make when they try to balance their quality of life and desirability of where they learn. But we have to kind of go and take into account in terms of those things that there is an inherent cost. And the cost isn't just financial, it's in terms of our own psyche, our, our, you know, quality of life in terms of and all that and reflect on that. But that's how you directly answer our participation and role and why inflation is the way that it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And you mentioned the, the hybrid work model. I want to talk more about that because I think that over the last two, two and a half years, I've seen so many companies go to this with the work from home and then, Hey, we're getting back in the office, you know, maybe come in say a Monday or a Friday or just one day a week. So part of it also too, is what I want to talk about in terms of inflation and getting to this hybrid work model is there are some structural issues that have been going on in terms of the economy for decades, for well over 40 years that has essentially made it more and more, out of reach for people to get by fundamentally the cost of housing, you know, which directly leads to the other aspects of the cost of living as you're seeing as now in terms of in fuel prices, what it is, the cost of transportation. So getting in terms of to work and thirdly, you know, most people, which is, you know, the hidden kind of what I would say specter that's out there is the cost of getting an education. And that is just an overall tax on most working professionals that in addition to the cost of living, they have to go and pay back a student loan. And finally, in terms of which has been healthcare, the hybrid work environment is going to go and address in that conundrum of cost of living. And when I say in terms of in cost of living, many of us go and take into factors a variety of things. There are work centers when we think of major cities, Los Angeles, we have Dallas, New York, but some of them could be largely unaffordable. So people traditionally without technology, like in terms of in your father's example, commuted. And what happened over time Property values kept pushing up. So people who used to live in Carlsbad, they lived in Escondido. Then they went to Temecula. Then they went to Marietta. Then there were now Sun City, Paris, further and further out because property values keep going up and up and up and up. Mm. But unfortunately, that's unsustainable. And so technology is kind of in a way is that maybe I'm living in Bozeman, but I'm commuting into work into Los Angeles. So now it opens up in terms of in a landscape of where cost of living, you can reassess into more affordable areas with the paycheck that you have and potentially effectively do work as though you're here. That has opened it up and we've clearly seen on that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, as a boon for business, because business can benefit as well, we don't need as much office space. So instead of having, you know, 50,000 square feet, 15,000 square feet, they can kind of contract for those days that we need in office meetings, maybe less than 5,000 square feet. So I think that this is an untapped area that can be a clear antidote to some of the structural inflationary aspect that we as a country have not been able to tackle over the last 30 years. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly that. That goes on to, say, the cost of business, office space and everything like that. It's all a trickle down in terms of effect because directly in terms of that cost of living, when I was talking with a a client of mine who is a major, you know, in terms of um, lumber yard and house um, 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 home supplies, wholesaler, they're talking about their truck drivers, they're talking about their forklift operators and None of them can live, you know, within a, you know, at least an hour commute, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's a sad, unfortunate indictment of the cost of living. But the thing is, when we look at in terms of in our temporary situation, when we go in inflation, what's 
When we say temporary, we mean transitory that will go away and what's structural. And what I want to talk about so that people can understand in what's structural, that cost of living issue has always been there and it's and it's gotten worse. And this hybrid work environment is the only solution that we as people and businesses have within our control that we can lean in versus what, you know, government can do in terms of making a better form of transportation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the hybrid model is is going to be the future for sure for companies that you don't need that storefront. And if you speak to clients, we've had a few different ones here at our company that are okay with it. They're right. okay with having that smaller office. The deliverable is still there with the professionalism and the integrity and the knowledge of of you and yourself for the for the business and the clients are still happy. Right. So why why do we need those those big office spaces? It's just cultural what people are used to because certain habits are come hard to die. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. like the idea of driving a pickup and an SUV is that people when they have families and you know like storing tools and lugging around and traveling. That's just what we've been raised. And the same mm-hmm. thing goes in terms of in our housing choices. You know, believe it or not, the average home for a family of four was less than eleven hundred square feet in nineteen seventy three, and then today. When people are talking the perspective of family of four, it's 4,500 square feet or more. So we're, we're not looking in the proper prism of in terms of what we actually need. We've created in terms of in our mindset something that's what we call the need category and the have to have, but it's really not. And that's why I say when we're trying to directly to address inflation properly, we have to seriously look at and take clear account of what we're contributing into that, because that's what we've largely been building these mm-hmm. big, massive single family homes that the average starting price are north of a million dollars. And no one can afford that. But we have to get into what's really more practical in the needs of, you know, in terms of our family. And many families had less than 1100 square feet 40 years ago, mm-hmm. and they were just fine. Yeah, yeah. Running off that, I think the the general gist in the room is that we Now, as people, uh, my generation and then your generation, we're going to, we always want to live above our means, but it seems like we're just using so much, for example, space with the homes and stuff, the example that you just mentioned. Are we going to have a change in how we view what we need versus what we have? The way we have the change is we as the consumers understand the power to vote. And your most important power to vote is how you spend your money. And so all what we see around us is because largely how consumers have voted. Mm -hmm. They've wanted big, you know, backyards that look like resorts. Mm -hmm. You've seen the outdoor backyards. Yeah, the outdoor barbecues. You've seen in terms of the pools and spas. And also, too, the nice garden areas. Mm -hmm. You're also seeing, you know, it's not just a kitchen, but we have to have a big pantry, not just a closet, but Two walk-in closets. Two three-car and, garages. And I'm not talking for the ultra-wealthy. I'm talking for the entry-level house. And we as consumers have been fueling into that versus more, do I really need it? And all what I just want to do to go in, in terms of and preach out there, our number one goal and what I have seen as an advisor is that we're really trying to attain some degree of financial independence, meaning that as I work and I build up in terms of savings, that I feel as though I can reach some degree of independence, that I'm not two paychecks away from bankruptcy. But what shackles us into that is forcing ourselves into a lifestyle or an ideal of what we call a middle-class life suburban lifestyle that may not be us, but we believe it's socially what we're supposed to do. All I'm just stating is, as an advisor, that it's created an illusion that has put many people into a situation that the vast majority cannot afford. And that's such a tough mentality to, once you're in it, to get out of it because that's not the norm. And also, too, many people, as we've been raised, we want to be accepted Mm -hmm. by our peers. And if you are working counter and getting ostracized, I mean, you go in terms of and tell your wife, you want to make your wife happy. You want your kids to have a wonderful backyard that they all go run around. They want to be close to what we call premier school districts. 
you just can't be in an empty house. That's why you go to Costco every single weekend. You can't have a Honda, you know, s- a sedan. You've mm-hmm. got to have an SUV. The point I'm just trying to state to all our neighbors out there is that those choices that we're making is obviously making us enslaved and we're not largely happy and we're in debt and we're more and more anxious about our future, our security and our stability. And we really need to go and take into account what's most important to us. What do we really need? And that makes us happy for ourselves or our family because Mm -hmm. in different time periods, A middle-class family and various, you know, upper-middle-class families did not have 4,000 square feet, and they were perfectly fine, and they took their family vacation. They went out to Little League and and Pop Warner football and soccer, no different. But it's just when you look at all the families with the smartphones, the iPads, multiple streaming services and cable, and as well as when you're looking at, you know, in terms of in these designer gourmet kitchens, there is a cost to it, you know, and it does add up. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that goes, it it just all ties itself together with consuming so much, whether we are quote unquote over consumers or it's just we're, we're chasing the Joneses or we just want to maintain a balanced life. But what is a balanced life? I think unfortunately, Brian, is when you go back to when you're younger and going through school and as you get older and you start having a family, much of it is we're trying to fill, we're trying to live our lives to uh, seek the approval of others. And when we really think about what we did, why we studied certain majors, we went to school, we, you know, in terms of got married, we went in terms of and lived, we were all trying to seek the approval and making sure that we lived, you know, in terms of a a quote unquote lifestyle of what we were expected in terms of to do. We just have to kind of go and just take some serious thought and deliberation that much of those choices are leading us down a path that is not sustainable and that it's overly consumeristic. And also, too, at the end of the day, Brian, we have a massive mental health crisis. So what you're telling me that if the average person can get readily AirPods, can have Netflix, can have these all these what we call little luxuries, why are more younger people and especially people with families and their kids reporting massive amounts of, you know, depression than it was 20 and 30 years ago. So what is changing? The consumer goods is not Mm -hmm. aiding in that. So we really have to go and think down in terms of how we fill and nurture ourselves and our soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's tough for so many, so many people, because I think that once again, the general aura around is that, when you look at yourself in the mirror, are you truly happy that you have that 4,000 square foot house? You have that, that Escalade, you have those, the, the two wonderful kids and stuff like that. Are you truly happy? Or are you just trying to live and exist in a life that other people do? Yes. And unfortunately it's, it's basically many of us in our lives, we, we comport ourselves as though we're lemmings. We just want to follow the pack with no questions asked. And in, to achieve great success and to ascend to greater personal s- success in both life and business, you have to be. You have to adopt the mentality of the contrarian. You have to have the courage to go against the pack. It's hard. It's tough. Mm-hmm. But when you make those decisions and you stand out there and have that courage and saying, hey, wait a minute, there's some insanity going out there. Why do I need to ha- spend my wife? And my paycheck, over half of our paycheck, just for a mortgage payment. That's the definition of insanity. But many people do it. They do. Or to go and basically have, if they have to have a $1,200 car payment. So going and holistically looking in some of those choices and facing if it is the the ridicule, the, the criticism within their family or their friends. But I'm telling you from personal experience, that courage and being able to do that and to prevail, then you'll basically have the last laugh. I didn't, I wasn't able to afford to buy my first house until I was 32. And much of the reason why was during in the times when it was in those early 2000s was in the similar, you know, out of control real estate market like we've seen in the last few years. 
And the, the difference was that real estate prices were literally going up by the day and the week. And the other difference was, is that no matter who you were, you could have been a kid who's just recently out of high school, had a pulse, a mortgage company would have given you a mortgage literally for breathing. Obviously that's not what's going on now. They've kind of wisened up, Mm -hmm. but that was literally the hysteria going on. And I stood out on a ledge with, you know, little kids, no way. And I faced a lot of criticism of just trying to live in terms of a Spartan existence. It's tough. Puts your marriage at risk, you know, you know, in terms of your kids and, and in terms of people's happiness. But guess what? Lo and behold, you know, the market really, you know, erupted in 2008. We saw a massive crash that many people, you know, I was literally listening to all oh, real estate never goes down. No, there's a law of gravity in all assets and, and in economics is you can't violate the laws of gravity. Yeah, you can't fight that. Exactly. And I, I saw it in terms of coming, but I, I faced many, many years of, of criticism and just being ostracized. Yeah. And, and looking back on that, I was younger and I, I remember some of the struggles of, for example, for example, I saw people in my neighborhood and then just, just with my family, we were, we were cutting down a little bit. I believe I was uh, 13 around that time playing baseball and everything like that, doing traveling around playing baseball and I remember it actually got down to me and I remember sort of understanding what was going on, but not really. Didn't take the vacation, I don't believe, to go skiing, coming from, you know, middle class family and, and, and doing, doing quite well off. But for me as a young child to realize that, that that must have been significant. Now looking back on it, it was. So I think that 2020 happened, 2021, and now 2022, we're coming sort of out of that COVID era and people want to grow, but how, how can they, how can they grow with this looming inflation sort of chomping at their back, but yet them wanting to push away from the populace so that they can ascend? So fundamentally, in terms of we as consumers, we need to, as a clear takeaway, understand the power of our vote and how and we vote every day with how we spend our money Mm -hmm. in terms of in making in those critical choices, because much of in terms of when you see the runaway in terms of cost, what we've seen in terms of housing, which has been predominantly single family homes. It's because of basically people wanting in terms of, you know, of the homes with, you know, the home theater, you know, in terms of the big massive island Mm -hmm. and backsplash in terms on that looking in terms of in those choices of what we kind of need versus what are quote unquote luxuries. Secondly, in terms of what we're going to do in terms of and how we spend in all the different consumer goods, whether it comes down to clothing, it comes down to, you know, all the consumer electronics And also as well as on our travel choices, we have to go and look at holistically at those core things. Unfortunately, one of the things that's that's a bit, you know, kind of difficult and has always been, you know, kind of out there how we deal with education because the cost of education has just gotten totally out of control. And it's it's predated this whole current play because the massive inflation in education has been going on for well over 30 years and that plays into it you know in terms of and and an all that and w- what it means is, is that basically is if it used to cost 20,000 to get a four year degree and now it's 100,000 for others it's 150 that monthly student loan payment you're paying when you graduate just means that you from starting salaries have to push up so you see the trickle down throughout in terms of in the economy that if employers to go and attract employees that starting salaries have to go up prices have to go up there is a ripple effect and we as people have to understand how we play that role in the cost of education and what we're going to do about it, whether we are going to propose free community colleges or free public schools, but we need to have a policy answer to deal with the out of control cost of education because we as a society do clearly benefit by an educated workforce we can't as an answer say well gain education is a luxury 
because in the future, more and more jobs are based upon here, our knowledge capital mm-hmm. versus our brute labor. And that's mm-hmm. just a fact. Yeah. So therefore, we have to go and attain skills. But we, as from a national strategic priority, have to deal with the fundamental cost of getting that because it's totally out of control and is what you're seeing that directly influences our purchasing power as consumers and what you're able to do as a young person and starting out. Mm. Yeah. The, the difference in labor now to the future is going to be so much more intellectual. And then like we talked about with the hybrid work model, if we have all those smart college graduates that are now going to be entrepreneurs or going into tech and those industries, I think that that is going to sort of segue to set some people apart. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is we need, we still need to have people that go to college and stuff, but also it, it needs to be affordable at the end of the day. Because when you graduate college, what do you want to do? You want to get married. You want to have a car. You want to have a house. Then you're strangled down with student loan payments. And then you look at employers and employees say, I can only pay you this much. You can't do that. Yeah, it's you're, you're quite right in terms of, Brian, um, the economy that we are in in the 21st century is a knowledge-based economy. Not everyone needs in terms of a four-year degree or a postgraduate degree, but they clearly need skills. Mm -hmm. And many of those skills are going to have to happen post high school. And whether they're in terms of from community colleges or technical in terms of schools and trade programs and certificate programs, people need to go and attain in terms of what we call higher level skills to directly make not only make themselves employable, but also to to grow their earnings ability throughout in terms of their lives. Unfortunately, we're locking out more and more people by even making those programs affordable mm-hmm. as well. And people are shackled with six figure student debt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's appalling for me personally. I, I don't have I don't have the, the student debt like others have. I was very fortunate to uh to to get the college paid for and everything but but brian your generation has the power though you as your generation have to speak your voice and participate and vote and reflect and 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 really hold to account our elected lawmakers of what they need to concentrate on i mean this country spends almost a trillion dollars a year in the military national defense, just to make sure that we have the latest armament, but are they reflecting the needs of our leaders of tomorrow and our future leaders? And we can't in terms of in a country have people who are basically trying to start their lives, but to be handed and shackled with, you know, a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of debt. And, but your generation has to participate. You have to get out and vote. You have to speak your voice. You can't let basically what our country does and our national priorities be based in voice of the opinions of a minority. Because I know that many in your generation don't feel that way, but they're, they're not participating. They feel like it doesn't matter, but it does. You see this is the direct cause and effect of what happens so that you can clearly, you know, change the agenda. Mm-hmm. What, what was some of the key takeaways uh, that we talked about? We talked about inflation. We talked about the hybrid work model. And then we went more into uh, a little bit of the education system and uh, personal finance. Well, and one of stuff. the key takeaways, Brian, is in terms of um, the tip is to adopt the mindset of a contrarian. Try to look for opportunities that when you see a pack going a certain direction that you can go a different direction. Mm-hmm. And that is one of, in terms of the strategies in life and business that if we can employ can, you know, basically deliver success, but it's hard to do. And basically, you know, you're, you're trying to overcome a tremendous amount of social pressure, but finding the way to develop the contrarian mindset and also to taking a full account and inventory of how we are as a consumer and really prioritizing what's absolutely important and what's just solely in terms of, 
you know, a nice to have, but I don't really need it. Mm-hmm. And if we can really, really take a full account, we can empower ourselves as consumers and a sale above the crowd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I think um, everybody watching prioritize what's important, whether it be your friends, your family, your job, or yourself. Prioritize what's important. I think that'd be a uh, that that's a great takeaway for uh, for today is to just look at yourself in the mirror and take an account of what's what's around you and make those choices personally and. I think one of the sayings is, um, as I've told people in terms of inflation, is inflation should be meant as a wake-up call. Like when you go Mm -hmm. to the doctor and a doctor talks about your blood pressure, your cholesterol, you need to look at it as as an indicator, as a force, I need to change my lifestyle. Yeah. Just like when the doctor says, Brian, your cholesterol is getting out of control. If you don't get it in check, you're going to have a heart attack and stroke. The same aspect in terms of inflation, meaning that it's something largely out of your control. But if you don't take a real serious inventory in your life and what you really need, you are basically largely going to be, you know, shackled and not be able to feel as though you can live in terms of any, seek any degree of financial independence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you said it, uh, you said it perfectly. Any, any closing words for today? Well, let's all try to be in terms of good neighbors to everyone out there in this world as we're in these tumultuous, divisive times and see how we can Find ways to work together Mm -hmm. to build common ground for a better solution and a better tomorrow. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, guys.